Hello and welcome everyone back to the Backlot Banter monthly show here on Backlog Banter. You should subscribe to Backlog Banter if you yeah. want more great videos like this where we are going to discuss our favorite movies that we've watched in April and in March some, somewhat. You know, we took a break in March because it was it was Oscar season, baby. And, oh, yeah. you know, it, what are we it, it, weigh, other than it weighs the on Oscars? the mind. It weighs on the mind talking about that many movies. But yes. you know, we're back in April. We have our favorite April watches for you. We also have our top comedies for you. We're going to discuss that. You know, it's April Fool's Day. That's come and gone. But it's always good to look back and have a laugh about it. I'm joined, as always, by the uh, respondent, Tucker Hazel, and the verbose, Timo, Hel Timo Nelson. Uh, I was I, I was looking for some some adjectives to describe you fellas. Those are adjectives. I don't know if they're accurate adjectives. But <laughs> I will, they are adjectives. I will take verbose any day. Uh -huh. That is an yes. apt adjective to describe me. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see Indeed how verbose you are today. Talking let's about see. a couple let's of see. movies that you've been watching. Yeah, I yeah, mean, of course. Tanner, what's the plan? Should we dive right in and talk about some? Of, just go around the horns. Talk about the movies we've seen in this uh, oh so month of April. We surely can do that right after I say, you know, I just do, want to do the little reminders up top, you know, uh, join the Discord. That link is in the description. If you want to tell us about what, talk to us about movies that you're watching in the moment, uh, comment down below you, what you've been watching this month. What do you think of the movies that we brought up? If you've seen them, uh, the, your favorite comedies, once you roll around to that at, towards the end of the episode. But yeah, great stuff. Great stuff all around. I'm very excited. It better be. You boys. It, it, I, I swear to you, swear on my life that this is going to be a great episode. On, this is going on to be jaw. great stuff or else. On jaw, yeah. dude, it will be a great episode. Yes. Who me? Like to begin? Me, I want to begin. Timo. I want to begin because uh, April is the month of my birthday. Um, <gasps> and so as a birth month, have a, having a great time. Um, but because of this is, it's the end of the semester and school mm -hmm. is difficult. And for me, school is a lot of movie watching. So a lot of my, my, my films are for class. But this, that does not mean, you can see my letterbox right here. That does not mean <laughs> I did not enjoy them. Um, mm. And the film that I first, the, uh, this is the, the one non-April film I'm going to talk about. Just we'll going in chronological we'll order. Mm -hmm. um, Autumn Marathon by Daniela, what's this guy's name? Oh, man, this, this, is, this is a Soviet film for my Russian cinema mm -hmm. class by by uh, Gregory Daniela, uh, and mm. it is a 70s movie. It's from 1979. Ooh. And so think about what a new Hollywood 1970 movie is, and now just take all of that and throw it out the window because it's the Soviet okay. Union. And it's an say, entirely you know, different you know, context. The immediate movie that I thought, Hollywood movie that when you bring up 1979 that I think of is Ridley Scott's Alien. So is it in any way similar to Ridley Scott's Alien? No. Not at oh, all. No, okay. yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. You're no, right. supposed to be throwing things out the window. <laughs> Entirely. Oh, sorry, my bad. It's, these windows. It's yeah, 100... we're, gonna, we're gonna launch that out the out the air out the airlock. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, this movie, Autumn Marathon, I found fairly enjoyable. It is a dark <laughs> comedy kind of mm. where this dude is the most pathetic man ever. He's cheating on his wife, and he cannot. See B.L.B. documentary. The B.L.B. documentary. <laughs> He is unable to ever speak the truth. He's a pathological liar, and uh -oh. he just falls apart in this society of the late Soviet Union. And it's dark. It's really funny. There's a moment in which he gets he him and his wife separate on the bus. They like yeah. They yell at each other. She's like, "You're fucking cheating on me! Like, stop it! You're horrible! I hate you! I'm leaving! Get out!" And so he's like, "Oh, okay." And he gets out of the bus, and he's like angry <laughs> because he can't. You know, his life is totally has been ruined through mm. entirely the, his fault. It's his fault that it's all gone to shit. And he kicks like a box on the side of the road and it's full of bricks and he like <laughs> ah! <laughs> and it's this dry That's a shenanigan right there. That's a shenanigan. It's this Indeed. like really dry, really dark very Russian humor that I had a lot of fun watching. And it's a it, it, I, I dove, we dove into it and did real deep critical analysis for class but just on a surface level i found it quite fun to watch and enjoy no, so Timo, if you're thank looking, you it's oh. the first film maybe the second film from this class besides um mikhail kalatasov's the cranes are flying ah. that, that film and this film autumn marathon are two are like the first two that i would just recommend to anyone i think these mm. are watchable films that you, you don't need to understand you know 100 years of russian history to like sure. grasp what what's going on and what's important so if you are looking for a dark and a slightly depressing but totally different film, 
a little different drama, a bit of a rom drum. Check out all of the rom drum. Oh, okay. Um, well, Timo, thank you for that. Uh, I can always rely on you to provide films that are not going to make the thumbnail. So th thank you for that. <laughs> Uh, uh, can I start with some films that will definitely make the thumbnail? I think because... Tucker, if we're th if we're thinking on the same track here, I think it has already made the thumbnail based on what I've already made for the thumbnail. But oh, go well, right ahead. I, I don't. Well, well, it depends. I don't know what you put on the Read thumbnail. Read my mind, yet. Tucker. Read my mind. All right, uh, Robocop. <laughs> let's fucking go. No, I watched course. all four Robocop movies this month. After seeing the original one a couple years ago with Tanner and not really getting too into it, but I've discovered that something that endears me to understanding the world of a film of a series is to just go all in on a series. And I watched all four Robocop movies within the span of a weekend, and I'm definitely a Robocop fan. And I would say a bigger RoboCop fan than most RoboCop fans. Not because I have a history with it, not because I, I, I'm reminiscing about my childhood watching Alex Murphy shoot some bad guys, but because I actually like all four RoboCop movies, which apparently is incredibly, incredibly controversial. The first <laughs> one, classic, revered, Paul mm -hmm. Verhoeven, you know, big mm -hmm. name director. Mm -hmm. Then they throw it to, to a couple other guys for two and three that are, they're very whack, they're much wackier, they're, they're a little bit weirder, but I thought they were both very fun. And then there's a reboot with uh, with the Suicide Squad's own Joel Kinnaman as mm. Alex Murphy, which is a lot more grounded and it's got Samuel L. Jackson and uh, a stacked and a, cast, yeah, by a, the way. a very stacked cast. Um, uh, Mank Man, uh, Gary Oldman, Gary Oldman, Gary Oldman. Uh, Mank Man, Mank Man, Mank Man. Uh, Mank Man. But I thought that all these movies were really fun, so I'm just gonna sort of say. I recommend all the RoboCop movies. You may not enjoy them, but I think there's something special to take away from each of them. Whether you're talking about a uh, a kid who's a drug dealer in in three, I believe, or uh, the fact that uh, Samuel L. Jackson basically plays Alex Jones ripoff in uh, in the reboot, yeah. it, there's a ton of fun to be had in this franchise. Yeah. Well, Tucker, uh, if, if we're going to go on, if we're going to go talking about binges, I think that there's one binge that we, uh, th our friend group, to varying extents, uh, uh, engaged in, and that is a cage binge, a term oh. that was thrown around yeah. quite often. Uh, I'm not in, talking in, about a cage our... today. Never <laughs> okay, oh, sorry, sorry. Okay. Uh, well, a, a term that was nonetheless thrown around a lot uh, over the course of the month uh, in our friends in our friend group chat. Uh, I just have a few that I want to bring up here. We watched uh, in you know various uh, either we got a big group together or it was one or two of us or three of us. We watched both Ghost Rider films, Next, Face Off, Con Air, Adaptation, Gone and Gone in sixty seconds. Uh, and I said Con Air. Okay, good. Um, and looking, I've seen some of these. I have I, I've seen some of these for the first time now. And looking back. All very solid, except for uh, Next, which I'll just say. Next is not a good movie. No. It's, it's all over the place. Tucker uh, was visibly in pain while watching it, I should say. It's a really bad movie. Yeah. Really uh, bad. The, the, the main crux of this film, it, which is sort of what betrays it, is that Nicolas Cage can see like a few minutes into the future, yeah. uh, which means that scenes play out uh, for the audience and then it's revealed that actually that scene didn't happen, so it doesn't matter the information that you that you obtained. Aww. Yeah, yeah, um, and it also there's... lends itself to the action sequences in yes. which he'll go through an action sequence and he can just dodge everyone's punches because he knows when they're gonna punch him. But that just means he's like walking around and like ducking and stuff, and it's not like that exciting. It's just it's a it's a really lame way to execute yes. on a pretty interesting premise. Yes, a, a lame execution of a cool premise. That that's what we're describes next. Um, but if I if I just want to go through some of my favorites that we watched, um, Con Air was one that I had seen before, but gained a new appreciation for. Uh, Nicholas Cage as Cameron Poe is like the ultimate aura of goodness in man. Uh, he's on a he's on a a prison transport plane full of the worst and most vile and disgusting criminals in the country. Yeah. And of course the plane gets taken over by these prisoners and he has to, you know, sort of uh, through subterfuge and through uh, ass kicking action, take this plane back and get to his wife and daughter who are waiting across the country for him. And the action is fantastic. It's funny. All the, uh, you know, John Malkovich plays the infamous Cyrus the virus and he's fantastic just being this 
super hateable, uh, but like still conniving and, and sort of smart and like it elements likable because you're just like this guy. He's funny. John Malkovich is very funny in this movie, as is uh, a lot of the other people. Nicolas Cage, I think, even has an element of that humor to him. It has the classic Nicolas Cage look of the the long hair blowing in the wind and things mm, of that nature. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm sure we've all we're familiar with this gif. Um, but moving on to stuff like Gone in 60 Seconds is a personal favorite of mine, uh, just because it has a bunch of cool cars that go real fast. Uh, and a- another great cast there, another great role for Nicolas Cage. Um, Who doesn't and, love movies uh, with cool cars that go real fast, you know? Absolutely, I do. Absolutely. Do. And of course, there is the Nicolas Cage classic Face Off that I had never seen before engaging in this Cage binge, which is... Maybe my one of my favorite Cage performances as Caster Troy, and then, uh, as you know, the the characters gets their get their faced they get their faces off and then swapped. So now that Nicolas Cage is portraying uh, the he is the John Travolta role, and John Travolta is playing the Nicolas Cage role, and it's fun to see them like <clears throat> balance these things out, and you know. Uh, pre- have to pretend to be themselves in some instances, but then convince people that they're not themselves in other instances. It's really fun. Very much recommend. Uh, John Woo is a fantastic action director, so all the action is great in this. There's a the climactic scene uh, involves Nicolas Cage hanging off the side of a speedboat with no water skis, and yet still like water skiing. Kind oh, doing of the doing barefoot. Feet. Oh yeah, yeah, that's basically awesome. basically uh, barefoot water skiing. Fantastic. So Nicolas Cage. What a what a man! What an actor! What an icon of the acting uh, of the acting industry. I don't know if you call it an industry. Yeah, uh, <laughs> he has he has an acting school to himself in a lot of ways. Uh, that it was sort of slightly betrayed by the unbearable weight of massive talent, which this was, of course, in preparation for. Uh, you can see that review. I'm sure there's a link in the corner that you can click on, or just go to the channel. It's yeah. easy to find. It's got a beautiful thumbnail. Tucker and Tanner oh, racing after each other. Yes, yes, of course. No, Tanner's not in it. It's just me. He, if Tanner just looks a lot like uh, Tanner look a lot just like Pedro looks Pascal. like Pe- Pedro yeah. Pascal. So this is true. I got the mustache, so there's there's that. There's Tanner that Tanner sure. is Iowa Pedro Pascal. <laughs> Absolutely, I am. I'm Absolutely, saying I am. Uh, I think we're swinging back around to you, Timo. Mm, okay. Well, one of these films that I watched recently uh, is a is a classic film that many people know, and is a bit of a meme film, even though it's in its uh, origin origin not quite the memeiest film ever. It's American Psycho. I haven't oh. seen this film yet. Um, and for some reason, some of my friends hanging out on Discord had got really into re- watching movies in the, in the way they're really meant to be seen, which is by going to the website twitch.tv, finding mm-hmm. a streamer who is streaming movies on loop, <laughs> and then watching that not on Twitch, no. Through another website, I don't even know which one, that's like rebroadcasting the Twitch stream, but with a different Mm. chat on the side. I don't know what's up with that. But then, not watching that either, I watched my friend streaming through Discord that website of Twitch streaming another website streaming the movie. And three levels of streaming going on here. And guess what? I didn't have to pay for the movie. Uh, So... And the subtitles were on, and the audio was on, and there was like no lag or delay or anything. So like, mm. it was it was fairly similar to watching the movie normally on the computer. Um, and yeah, that was a fun movie and fun to watch with some other people too. Because man, yeah, there's there's moments that's just like are just like so strangely comedic when he's just like mm-hmm. talking yes. about the album, and he's like, <laughs> Patrick Bateman is just this crazy, you know, he's a crazy character. He's he's our role model. Yeah. Insane. Now, Tim, but Timo, did you know that American Psycho is sort of okay. being a, a, a satire of capitalism? I didn't pick did up on know? that. I didn't pick up didn't on that at all. Oh, during the, okay. the film, the film. Yes, I picked up on that. <laughs> <laughs> but also, Timo, and I think I think this is what Tucker was alluding to. Did you know that American Psycho was directed by a woman? Actually, <laughs> did you know that, Timo? Like, I did. did. You know, I Hang did. On. Did I, could I tell? Did I know? I did know um, mm-hmm. going into the film a lot about, you know, what the film is about and, you know, having seen many clips and, you know, meme screenshots from it, but I'd never seen it. So it was fun to watch it and just kind of reminded me of this, like, oh, that late 90s, like the 90s vibe of America. 
Mm-hmm. I don't know. The more the more I learn about it, the less I like it. Yeah, this oh. and American Beauty kind of go hand in hand and make this you go. Like, true. I kind of hate the middle to upper class in the nineties. Yeah. Like, Nineteen ninety nine yeah. and two thousand, right? Yeah, back. To back. Uh, uh, there was we thing. had a similar experience because we watched this film for our film club, our school yes, film did. club. Um, which is maybe you know a very not a very appropriate movie in general, but we watched it in the school. Yeah, with, it's you college. Know, a bunch Who of cares? It's college. No, hey, yeah. I didn't say it was a bad thing. Uh, it was in, like relatively inappropriate for the context we were watching it in. But it's an interesting movie because it sort of straddles the line between being a great movie, like a, a very well written, very well acted, very interesting story movie, but also having been co opted into being so many memes. Yeah, that you're mm-hmm. watching these sequences and you're like. Oh, this is you know this is a really good moment within the writing of the story, but also God, I've seen this so many times as a meme, uh, and, and it, it kind of it, it's fun because of that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's when really he gets the cha- when he's this, chasing uh, after you know, the chainsaw, oh, I I had never even you know seen that bit before. Oh, sure. When he's got yeah, yeah. and he's like Argh! and he's like he's naked, and I could tell. Yeah. I see his he I see I see it's, his little thing swinging miss, around there. Uh, Christian Bale, you know, unit of an actor, and he's a pretty pretty unitized in this film. <laughs> Unitized indeed. It is interesting to see, you know, how how it's been co-opted first by first by like the actual real like Sigma male grind set people, and then like twisted on its head to be mm-hmm. uh, an inverted version of that. Yeah, Tucker, what do you have? Uh, nice. Let's see Tucker Hazel's next movie. My next movie is not one movie; it's an entire franchise of movies. <clears throat> uh, yet a fucking gin because I did. Monkey binge. This monkey binge. Month, which, monkey which of course binge. means that I watched every film. I, I have now seen every film in the mm-hmm. Planet of the Apes oh. franchise. Uh, primarily watching the original five films. Yes. Are, no, no, Timo, I actually, I don't know your experience with this. Are, are you a fan of the original Planet of the Apes series? Yes, I haven't seen all of them. I've seen like the first three, I think. Um, okay. The ones, I haven't seen the ones where they bring the apes back to Earth. But I've seen the other ones that take place on the Planet of the Apes. You know, the ones with dudes hiding in the second one. The second one. Mm, that one's, I love the second one. Of course, the first is classic Planet of the mm-hmm. Apes. You know, it won Best Makeup beating out all 2001 over there. But <laughs> I, um, yeah, I love Planet of the Apes. It's just a childhood favorite of mine. My dad showed it to me and I've, been, I've, I've seen all of them. Or what? Not all of them. Like three of them. Plus all the new ones, too. Yeah. yeah, so there are there are five in the original series. There is uh, Tim Burton's remake, which I also watched alongside Tanner, and then there's the the new trilogy. Um, but so what's interesting about this series is you say you're talking about the one that, the, taking place on the planet of the Apes, not the ones where they brought them back to Earth. The, v- the fascinating thing about this original five films is they kind of tell a loop of a story if you watch them all in order. So you start off. Um, with the astronauts landing on the planet of the apes and, and learning that at the end of that movie that it actually is Earth. And through the second one, um, you, you learn a little bit more about that. And at the end of the second one, the planet is destroyed. And so from the third movie on, you're back to the beginning of the, the quote unquote beginning of the timeline before where the first and second one take place. Um, and I actually would say, Timo, and I, I'm sorry to burst your bubble, but the second movie, which is called Beneath the Planet of the Apes, is the worst movie in the entire franchise. That no. movie sucks so much. No, they love the, the main, bomb. Th- they do love the bomb. Everything mm. with the, the the people living underground, that's fine. But the main character is a ripoff of the main character of the first one because Charlton Heston would not come back for the second <laughs> one. So they had to... Or he came back in a small capacity. He's in that movie. But um, it, it is a circuitous way to continue the story and it's really quite uh, underwhelming. I really don't like the movie. But... I think it kicks back up in the gear when you get to the third film, which is Escape from the Planet of the Apes, um, which is my favorite of them. Uh, it involves um, the two main apes from the first movie, uh, Cornelius and Zira, going back in time to human time and being exposed to human culture and humanity having to wrestle with the idea that, that they uh, are their own downfall in the future. And that kicks off the last two movies in which they give birth to their son, Caesar, he leads an ape uprising and apes become the, the dominant force on the planet in the fifth one. So you, you're watching this story unfold of learning about the history of this world and then watching the history of the world in the future, but in the past unfold. And it's really, really fascinating. And then Tim Burton made one uh, in which Mark Wahlberg goes to like monkey villages in the, in trees. And it's, 
like just not very interesting and pretty bad. Well, yeah, all around. that one is actually that one is that actually Mark Wahlberg does go to a planet of the apes. Yeah, he, go, he travels through a wormhole in space, uh, and then has some really uninteresting antics go about. And for then he like goes two hours, yeah. for like two hours. And then he goes back through the wormhole at the very end, only to find out that Earth has been taken over by apes. And he, he, he figures this out by seeing a, a giant, a giant Abraham Lincoln esque statue of an ape man. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, if you will. Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln. But mm-hmm. I, I highly recommend watching the entire series, even if there are a few that are There's not few stinkers, as interesting. Yeah, um, yeah in, in, including. Do I do I recommend the Tim Burton one? I don't know. I think it's interesting in, in conversation with the rest of the franchise, but yeah. uh, it certainly is the one I would say to skip the most. Even though I do think beneath, I do think Beneath the Planet of the Apes is worse. I'm sorry, Devo. Um, <laughs> no, but no. yeah, it, it it's a film that or it's a series that people don't really talk about. The majority of the films in the franchise that there are there are nine of these fucking movies, and people really only talk about the new ones and the original. There's still four that come after that, and mm-hmm. and some of those are actually really good. Conquest being about uh like conflict and racism, and and Escape being about like the psychology of humanity and coming to coming to uh, interact with an alien species or the apes rather. But I I think there's a lot of really cool stuff to to dig into here. Um, and it's it's just kind of sad to me that you know most of this franchise has been pretty much forgotten. Dang man. Okay. Well, I will totally go back and finish out the the original series because. If if your word is truth, you Tucker, and I you and I could talk about this. We could do we could do a ranking the Planet of the Apes series. We could video. we could. That'd I be would really fun. because man the original I love the original. The original Planet of the Apes is a very great movie. movie. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just have very fond memories of the second one. Who knows if it actually sucks or not? If it does, <laughs> that would be unfortunate. But it won't. It won't. I I stand by my opinion on this film. Mm-hmm. I will I will have to see in the month of May. Perhaps it's time that I pick back yeah. up the Planet of the Apes. A summer monkey bench? Perfect way to kick off summer, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Summer. Summer. Uh, okay, I, I, it's a background to me, so I think we should actually um, talk about the movie that we probably should have started off this video with, which is uh, what the <laughs> thumbnail is going to be centered around, and that is the new hit film, Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. The um, new best movie of all time. According to okay. Letterboxd users, asterisk, according to Letterboxd users, um, which is the only correct metric to measure these things, of course. True, great point. Um, but yeah, we we watched it back at the beginning of the month-ish, yeah, I think, yeah. Um, and uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, not as much as uh, as my cohorts, of course. Tucker has this at five stars after uh, re- re-watching it as well. Tucker's seen this two times now. Um, and everyone else that we went to the theater with uh, put it at four and a half, five stars. I have it at four stars. Still very enjoyable movie. But I think, you know, this movie is taking a world by storm. So I think we should address it a little bit. Timo, you haven't seen this. I have correct? not gotten to go okay. see it yet. I'm bummed. I've been trying to, but it is hard to find time to go to the theater and watch it, which is well, probably how I should. Okay, well, I, I suppose we can we we can sort of talk about it in generalities, our general thoughts, without without getting into I don't know spoilers. But Tucker, what do you think? Is is that spoilery stuff in this? Well, I would say we should avoid discussing for both Timo and for the audience mm-hmm. members who may not have seen this film yet. Right. Dis- d- avoid discussing specific Plot moments points, that stand yeah. out to us because, frankly, the experience of this movie and being consistently surprised by the creativity is the experience of this film, and I think mm-hmm. why it's so highly regarded but for me why it it hits the high metric is because it takes my, one of my favorite movies of all time is swiss army man which is the daniel's uh, first co-directing film timo and i watched that together a couple years ago and mm-hmm. I, I i believe i remember him enjoying it quite a bit. i did that was a very uh, enjoyable film to watch yeah and, and what it does and as we'll get into with our with our comedy discussion mm-hmm. uh, i really like it when films are able to take really wacky concepts with like basically fart humor. And of course, that was a big part of mm-hmm. Swiss Army Man. Uh, and and use light tone and creativity to tell a very powerful emotional story. And I do think that that's what this film does best in, in, in its wackiness, in its creativity, in its over the top action and comedy and, and sci fi nonsense. There is a really strong core human element because this core cast uh, is so fantastically wrapped around one another and their lives are intertwined in interesting ways. Um, and I, so I, I absolutely fell in love with this movie. I do think that's one of the best movies I've ever seen because it fits so closely with my sensibilities of 
filmmaking and comedy and, and heartfelt storytelling and character writing and stuff like that. Um, and it's just it's vi it's visually pleasing. It's so it's so off the fucking rails. Yes. There, there's shit in this movie you never thought you would want to see on a, on a big screen, but you will. And yep. suck it up, and you're gonna enjoy it. Fuck it. <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna enjoy it, Daniels. Um, yeah, I well, speaking of the Daniels, they're the ones that I really want to uh, applaud in my discussion of the film here because I think in retrospect, I much of my enjoyment is just uh, really realizing how unique they are as filmmakers they are mm. maybe one of the strongest and most unique creative voices in in hollywood right now you know yeah. they came strong out of the gate with the uh i, I will say i'll say cult classic uh sure. swiss army man mm -hmm. and yeah. then now they have the highest rated movie on letterboxd this film is expanding into uh many other theaters across the country because it's doing very well at the box office yeah i think it is because they crafted something you know this movie's like two hours and 20 minutes mm -hmm. of just crazy zany off the wall incredibly visually uh adept and interesting imagery um the, the, but then outside this movie of that, might have the most impressive editing i've ever witnessed yeah, the, in my life in terms of the amount of match mm -hmm. cuts in this fucking movie yes like like literally like a a, a shot a sequence will be like 60 match cuts in a row Brrr, it's like yeah how the, how the fuck did they do that? And I think um, something, something that I learned that was very interesting was that uh, the Daniels did not do any second unit photography for this film. Every single frame of everything everywhere all at once is a, is a frame that was overlooked and directed by the Daniels. And that's something that you don't really get with um, you know, big blockbuster films. And this film has all the markings of that. It's a multiverse film. We have you know a big star in it, Michelle Yeoh, uh, in, in, the, in the title role. It's an action sci-fi comedy uh, dr slash drama, which is, you know, and the dramatic elements are very done as well. That's, you know, that's uh, the directing from the Daniels. And it is the <clears throat> fantastic performances from Michelle Yeoh and... Oh, I'm going to... Kihee Kwan, I, Kei James Kwan. Hong, yes, Stephanie yes, Sue, yes. Uh, Jamie Lee Curtis. Oh, yeah, Jamie Lee Curtis, I completely great forgot. Cast, was in this. Great yeah. cast, a great cast. A great cast, a small cast, either way. You know, that, that's only like four or five names that we listed off there. But they're so... They're, they're tight and they're compact and they bounce off of each other very well. And they have this great zany material to work off of. And it, it works super well. Um, the, the only detraction I would have, and I'm sure this improves on a rewatch, as Tucker can attest to, is... It's a very busy film. It's doing a lot. It's saying a lot. There are overlapping universes and timelines and what's going on here. And we're jumping in a little hard cut to another universe where something com a completely different scenario is going on. And yeah. it, it, it's all intertwined into this, you know, this uh, a ball of twine that is this film. And it can be hard to parse out. Uh, it can be hard to parse out. Um, what it on a first watch as it was for me and i'm i think tucker you even said this on your rewatch that it was much easier to you know, sort of decode that on, on a rewatch so maybe a film that you need to rewatch a quite a, a a bit of a depth uh marketing there from the daniels making a making a film that you have to see twice at the that very is least. that is so enjoyable to see once it only gets better on the second time yeah yes yeah and it's, that's another reason why i also applaud its its editing and its writing is because it is overwhelming but you don't necessarily feel lost you just don't you might not be able to understand it fully yeah. on, a, on a first watch but i never felt like oh i don't know what the rules of this of this world are i don't mm -hmm. know where the characters are and, and the editing especially being able to tie in so many different storylines that are converging into one place and all end up in, impacting the end of the story is really impressive in how they're able to keep it all straight in a viewer's mind who is this is not a franchise movie. This is not something that's previously established. You have no previous information going in other than what they tell you in a chronological order. And it's really impressive how they were able to weave it all together. Yes, absolutely. So I can't wait to see what the Daniels have up their sleeve next because they are coming very strong out of the gate, you know, just in the first few years of their filmography. Incredible stuff. Absolutely. But uh, Timo, do you have anything else for us to talk about? I got one more film to talk about. Okay, great. Well, we should do one more. How about that? All right, all right. So oh, wow. my final film that I want to talk about is one that I watched like just a couple of days ago, and it's a documentary. Actually, one that I, I, I you know, I'm a, I'm a documentary enjoyer. Oh, I would like to watch one, but I there's a specific genre of documentaries that I haven't really seen a lot of, and that's like the film where the filmmaker is really present and has mm. a real strong voice. 
in the documentary. So I watched Bowling for Columbine, which is a Michael oh. Moore documentary from like 2002. And mm. that was really good. It was really funny. And man, that guy, he knows how to do some ideological editing because he will say things and then you'll cut to the next shot and you'll be like, ah, yes, the contradiction between what was said in this shot and what was shown in this shot is extremely clear. And mm-hmm. that makes for a very fun and engaging documentary on a subject that I think, even though the film is lighthearted, it's funny. You know, they, he interviews well, yeah, like that's... Matt Wall. The, what, what's the Matt Stone, right? The South Park creator? Not Matt Walsh. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, no, yes. Yeah. Matt Stone, Trey Parker are the South yeah, Park yeah. guys. So yeah. he, he talked to Matt Stone in, the, in it. And there's like a there's a there's clips from South Park. And yet the way it deals with its subject is really well, yeah, it's funny that you say that because you it's funny that you say this film is funny because from what I know, it's about Columbine and mass shootings. It's correct? about mass shootings. Yeah. And it ends with like an insane interview with Charlton Heston, who was the president of the NRA oh, back the then. The NRA president. Yeah, yeah. And uh, man, Charlton Heston, good in the Planet of the Apes, good in Ben-Hur, not so good in real life. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not a great guy overall. And but yeah, I mean, there are moments where like he would where Michael Moore would throw together some elements in a sequence and I would just be like, you're shitting me. This is not real. You made this up. <laughs> and then I think about it a little more. I'm like, no, there's no way that it's not. There's no way that it's fictitious. It is real. That's really what? interesting. What? Mm-hmm. And it would yeah, just make me outraged. You make, you make an interesting point about the the creative voices behind documentaries not usually shining through in a particularly strong way. You can piece together what usually what most documentaries are going to be like editing wise and pacing wise and putting together interviews and and b-roll and stuff like that but having having a tone of comedy and self-awareness and and uh depth into the discussion of the material in a sort of different angle sounds Mm -hmm. really interesting and i just i added the film to my watch list but i i'm probably going to try to watch it soon because i like documentaries but i usually feel that they're kind of more of the same and i usually just just watch it for learning about a topic and not for the filmmaking itself yeah so, yeah yeah certainly very interesting well Michael having Moore is one of those documentary guys of course so yes it, i've never seen any of his films either yeah i mean he is a, a, in a large part responsible for the huge documentary boom we see nowadays on like netflix where people were kind of in the early 2000s awoken to the idea that a documentary could be as entertaining as a narrative film um it's just they're just constructed you know very differently of course mm-hmm. this is the oscar winning documentary it won mm. the the and uh, it won the award Best and yeah. michael moore went up in 2003 i guess was oh when the, ceremony. the infamous and, I, okay yeah. and he started railing about uh about bush and iraq uh and uh Got the booed. oscars booed him yeah for it but it's just a just a weird little turnaround that you know, these people were booing him for saying that the iraq war was bad and that bush was a bad president oh, <laughs> a weird man. turnaround yeah well history's been pretty kind to michael moore and yes. not so much the oscars yeah uh tucker you got one more for us no well everything ever all once is my last oh, one sure so I think okay okay um it there I think uh, we also watched Ambulance and the Fantastic Beasts and uh, 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 Secrets of Dumbledore. That's what it was called. Fantastic Um, Beats Beats and the Secrets of Dumbledore. uh, But I think I'm actually going to talk about a movie that I watched for film class, uh, Phoenix by Christian Petzold, a a very adept and very popular German director working right now. Phoenix is from 2014. Uh, I won't say a lot about it because um, yeah, I, I think it's better to go into this film, you know, being being fresh on it li- like I was. Um, but this is a five star movie for me easily. I think this is a fantastic film. You have uh, some great leading performances. Um, I'll give you the basic plot structure. It's sort of a how it was described to me. I watched this for a Hitchcock and his legacy course. Uh, and how it was described by our professor was that it it takes the bare bone, the skeleton of Alfred Hitchcock's vertigo, and just builds a very different aesthetic and a uh, very different film around that skeleton, that, around that idea of, you know, uh, a, a person looking like a person and you trying to, like, mold them into that person uh, mm. it, it is very interesting. Um, it, it it's set in a po- immediately post World War II Germany. You know the Nazis have just been defeated. The American occupation of Berlin is ongoing, um, and it's really interesting how uh, 
our main character is at the at the start of this film uh released from a concentration camp and has been uh major, majorly scarred in her face and has uh, plastic surgery and reconnects with her husband who you know she is trying to you know uh work her way up you know mentally and emotionally to to confront him again and we, we maybe we maybe get some some revelations about this guy that that change our perspective on him and change her perspective on him but yeah the one the thing i really want to applaud here are the performances namely from nina haas in the lead role she is fantastic singularly maybe one of the best performances i've ever seen given in a film so if you haven't seen phoenix i would definitely check it out okay wow super glowing review on that yes and that does it for our april watches so now we're going to roll right into our top three comedies we have we, we have a shortened list here you know we're trying to really pare it down to the creme de la creme uh for for gut busters so who would like to kick it off here with their number three uh, my list is in no particular order. I, oh, I, all right, I, fair I, enough. Uh, because I don't, I'm not a huge ranking man. Um, but I do really. I just got to throw it out there, man. Man, super bad is just so funny. Oh, that movie yeah. is so classic and so funny. And in it being a like a dumb high school comedy, I just vibe with that too much. I love super bad. It's ah. Uh, it it gets me laughing like crazy when I watch it. It really brings the howling howling laughter for me mm -hmm. when we're watching Super Bad. Yeah, it's one one of those. Um, Evan Goldberg and and Seth Rogen are, are sort of the classic writers of this film. Mm -hmm. You know, it's 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 become the quintessential stoner comedy. I think in a lot of ways, up there up there with things like Pineapple Express, which is also Rogen and Goldberg. Um, but I think this one is also you know has that element of uh, the high school coming of age thing. Uh, early performances from Michael Sarah and Jonah Hill are really mm -hmm, great. Mm -hmm. The uh, Emma Stone is in there as well. Yeah. Oh, you almost kind of forget that she's in that movie. She's not on the poster, but yeah. of course, how can you forget uh, Christopher Mintz Plus as McLovin? You know, McLovin just sort of transcended the film into be this like larger sort of cultural phenomenon that is, I am McLovin. Yeah, McLovin. You got you 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 got to love that guy. I mean, he's awesome. Uh, it was actually a uh, little trivia, because uh, I just know this. Uh, <laughs> Christopher Mintz Plus was actually 17 at the time that this film, uh, at the time that the film was being made. Uh, and he, of course, has a sex scene in the film. So his his parents had to be present on set while he, he, he has the sex scene, wherein, of course, he, uh, I think he, he busts his nut, if you will, after only a number of seconds. <laughs> so... His parents get, were in the room get for that, that shot a couple times, a couple takes of that. Yeah, a couple yeah, takes yeah, of that yeah. with your parents in the room. Uh, but yeah, Super Bad is, is, is a very good movie. One that I'd like to revisit at some point for sure. Mm -hmm. Tucker. Uh, here's a movie that that doesn't need introduction because of how it's been sort of brought back up in the cultural consciousness recently. But Borat, the original one, I do ah. think that subsequent movie film is 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 good, but I don't think it stands up to the creativity of the original. And me watching it and being like, "What the fuck is this? Who is this character? What is going on here?" and and finding out because I didn't know almost anything about the creation of this movie before I watched it that he that uh, Sasha Baron Cohen was interacting with real people and these were real scenarios and the ridiculousness of it is bumped up to fourteen because. <laughs> Half the characters that are funny in this are just people, but living their lives being what what they consider to be normal. And you're like, how the we live in such a crazy world that Sasha Baron Cohen knows how to just poke a little bit of fun at and and make sure that you know that the world is wacky in sort of a dark way, in sort of a twisted way. But but of course, Borat and and his lines and his deliveries and this sort of weird external culture that they create around this character is so iconic and creative that it has sort of spidered its way into how do we conduct interviews? How do we approach politics with a comedic edge? Stuff like that. Like it's, it's such an impressive movie that, that is so iconic to me personally, even though I have, I only watched it just a couple of years ago for the first time. Sasha Baron Cohen is, he's one of the greats, obviously, because mm -hmm. what he, what he did with Borat set such a precedent for uh, other comedians and himself, especially that he had, you know, a hard time following it up. Cause that's, a, this is really his bread and butter is going under heavy prosthetics and makeup and yeah. embodying this, this character, whether it's like Ali G or Bruno or Borat, um, 
But Borat hit such a fever pitch and, you know, uh, jabbing at, you know, the American political consciousness yeah. that he did, you know, uh, mo the subsequent movie film wasn't made until 15 years later. Exactly. And he also has a Showtime series called Who is America, where he really has to one up himself because people are so attuned to like, this, is this guy fucking with me? Is this a Sasha Baron Cohen type Borat situation? Exactly. Yeah. It, it's really interesting how uh, Cohen has sort of, you know, painted himself into a corner and then subsequently has to paint himself out of that corner. It's real, and Borat is obviously fantastic. <laughs> there's a, there's, a, I mean, it, again, you're talking about something that's transcended with mm -hmm. the uh, my wife, very mm -hmm. nice. Yeah, talking like Borat. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Frankly, I probably even heard vo his voice and his cl and clips of dialogue before I'd even seen the movie or knew anything about it. Uh, just goes to show that. How how next level uh, this film has become. I, I definitely think it's one of the most creative comedy movies I've ever seen as well because of how its documentary structure yeah. uh, on a certain level it, it like plays with your expectations of comedy, which yeah. not very many films have the balls to do, frankly. <laughs> and you see um, a lot of balls in this movie. Yeah, yeah and you, Sasha Baron Cohen of... himself is a very ballsy man. Yes, indeed. You see a lot of balls, you, you see a lot of ass, you see a lot of gooch and everything yes. in between. Um, but I want to go to a film uh, more contemporary, probably the most contemporary that we'll have on this list, maybe, I'm going to assume. Uh, and that is 2016's Shane Black's The Nice Guys. Um, I've really gained an appreciation for this film just through the comedic stylings in this film of Ryan Gosling and Russell Crowe, our fantastic comedy duo, a straight man and a wacky character, but they sometimes they flip these personas the, comedically. Um, ha, have either of you seen this film before? Yeah, I know Tucker has. Me, yeah. I haven't yeah. seen it, no. Uh, t Timo, I think you would absolutely adore this film. I, I okay. highly recommend this one to you because... Just the the manicness that Ryan Gosling has in that he's this like you know we, we're, we're we're presented with this 1970s Los Angeles everyone's rough and tumble they're all smoking cigarettes and they have big mustaches and he Ryan Gosling era. yeah exactly <laughs> Ryan Gosling is very much this character but he's it's a comedy of errors in a lot of way for him uh you you get introduced to his character I believe him sitting fully clothed in a bathtub drinking a bottle of gin. <laughs> uh, and it, that really embodies just like the sadness of this character and how funny it is just to see him go about and try to do this private detective work where <laughs> one of the funniest things is he start, he's like trying to break into a building and he like, he like elbows the glass and he like cuts it, but he like cuts his hand really bad. Oh, so he just starts, he starts, he, he like looks at it and he just falls to the ground. And um, there's the, there's scenes where, uh, you know, he, there's one where he's, on the toilet and he's like trying to pull his gun out and cover his dick with a magazine and like try not to drop everything while trying to kick the door open to point the gun at the guy outside of it. Great physical comedy, very witty, obviously when you're dealing with a Shane Black script here. Yeah, um Iron Man 3%. Iron Man 3%. Shane Black, very witty director. Um you get uh oh god, the the, the scene where uh Ryan Gosling, I think he gets high at like this 1970s Los Angeles in the hills party and there's like uh, girls dressed up as mermaids swimming in the pool and he's just like enamored by them he's just like looking at them and then it's a steady shot and you see him leave and then you see him enter the pool and like swimming around with the mermaids hilarious uh, Russell Crowe is great as the straight man to this zany Ryan Gosling character who is actually like the rough and tumble private detective who has to deal with this guy and um, the, their very first confrontation is great, where he breaks his arm and he's like, "I'm going to break your arm." And Ryan Gosling's like, "No, no, 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 wait!" And then the sound that Ryan Gosling makes is maybe one of the funniest verbal uh, sounds I've ever heard in movies when he gets his arm broken. It's hilarious. Um, but yeah, I love the nice guys, and it also it, it it has a bit of jabbing, you know, at 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 the uh, at the automotive industry, as a lot of these um I've noticed a lot of these you know, crime noir sort of thing set in the 1970s do. So very much, very, very much recommend The Nice Guys. Okay. <clears throat> well, my mine is also set in the 70s. It's a, uh, a little film by old Dink, Dick Linklater. It's Dazed and Confused. Oh, oh I love <laughs> Dazed and Confused. Man, I think Dazed and Confused is so funny. And it is, it just sits, you know, it's an Austin movie. I live in Austin. Like, mm. like I've, like, Matt Linklater, 
and um just uh, no big deal ah, <laughs> just the way in which all the characters exist the way to me the fact that like all of matthew mcconaughey's like macho crazy persona as an actor nowadays comes from like the lines and the way he mm-hmm. acted in that movie <laughs> you know his all right all right all right comes from that and mm-hmm. and some of some of those lines that are 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 just make me just ro- rolling on the floor raffling mm-hmm. really laughing raffling sure. all over the place Ruffle yeah if you will. yeah you know <laughs> I yeah, just oh man it, when they when they bring the keg and the dudes are trying to just like deliver the even though like I think that the story because I didn't grow up in that time my dad who did says it's like a it's like a documentary and it's far too accurate for its own good but for me <laughs> it's not because I, I never experienced that and so just to get to see the way that like you know this sleepy little town of Austin is hanging out in the 70s and oh there's a party at the moon tower man everyone's gonna be there come on by I just it's so much fun. I love Days yeah. and Confused. I'm a big fan of all Linklater movies too. Slacker, I think, is less of a comedy, but Days and Confused is just good times, funny, great movie. Yeah. The only thing I remember about uh, Days and Confused is that Ben Affleck is in it, and he hits some some high, some high school freshman on the ass with a paddle or whatever, yeah. and then he gets <laughs> paint thrown all over him. <laughs> yep. Plenty of yeah. plenty of great moments like that. Yes. I've got another high school comedy for us, boys. <gasps> because Felix Bueller's Day Off is one of the movies on the goddamn planet. I adore how this movie treats the audience like they like they know it's funny and the characters know it's funny. And there's like these scenarios that are painted in such interesting ways by the dialogue and how Ferris is just, he's just crazy. He's just He's subverting everyone and he's so clever and he's getting himself into these scenarios just so he can have a good time. And it's very, very few times that I, you watch a comedy where really the only, no, I, I need to rewind that. I was going to say the only straight man, but like, let, let's be real. Most characters in this, except for Ferris, are like the straight yeah, man. Yeah. Um, but where Ferris feels like in control of the entire situation. Even when things are going off the rails, he's playing it so smooth that you want to be on the side of this guy who's just mm-hmm. just fucking up everything for everyone, like all the time. But you you he's so endearing and his his friendship with his with his girlfriend and his buddy are are so well written and their dynamics are so well defined that they're thrown into all sorts of situations and it's all believable even when it's ridiculous. So I I I mean I don't think it's a hard sell to go watch Ferris Bueller's no. Day Off. But it, it's one of the it's one of the all time greats for me. It is, it, Tucker. I'm glad you picked this one. I was waffling between the nice guys and Ferris Bueller for my number three, uh, and I'm very glad that you picked this because I just about picked it. And I love Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Obviously, it's it, it's one of the John. It is like the John Hughes classic. I believe. Yeah, it's certainly my favorite of his. Yeah, for no, sure. I also enjoy Sixteen Candles. I also mm-hmm. like uh, Plain Trains and Automobiles. Yeah, he, he, he's a he's a great writer, great director. And, Matthew Broderick is fantastic He's as Ferris great. Bueller, but uh, Alan Ruck is also great as Cameron. Yes. Uh, and, you know, th- this sort of dichotomy of the characters, you know, with uh, Ferris Bueller saying, uh, you t- if you took a, key- a piece of coal and shoved it up Cameron's ass, in two weeks you'd have a diamond. <laughs> <laughs> and also, uh, I just wanted to say, this movie made me not like Risky Business because I thought that yeah. Risky Business was going to be a proto Ferris Bueller, and mm. it's just not. No. You can tell Tom Cruise's character was an inspiration for, and the concept of an inspiration for Ferris Bueller's Day Off, but that movie's nowhere near as funny, even though when sometimes when it thinks it is. I yeah. don't recommend Fer- Risky Business. Just go watch Ferris Bueller. <laughs> Yeah, I, I love how how John Hughes almost likes this like otherworldly sort of Chicago as well, which is like the weird characters that he puts in here, like uh, the the snooty uh, French restaurant maitre d and oh, the, yeah. the the two wacky like uh, parking attendants or whatever who take the car out for a spin. He he just he just throws all these like little weird characters in, and and Principal Rooney is is another like he just so doggedly focused on busting this kid <laughs> and um oh, what's the what's the what's the high school like secretary's character character name she's know. fantastic so with yes I I'm remembering many many <laughs> scenes with the her boys and and, and yeah. the spazzes and yeah the <laughs> he's a righteous dude <laughs> um fantastic oh. fantastic stuff 
Uh, my second one, I, I try to go for a, pl a, a wide range of different types of comedies here. Okay. So this one is a dark political comedy. Uh, I'm, I'm reaching back into the annals of history to, right. to, to, to pluck out Dr. Strangelove oh, or I How I yes, Love. Thank you for saying that. Yes. Bomb. Oh, I saw that movie so funny. If you want to talk about a com a movie that is all straight men who don't know what they're doing is funny at all, but it is hilarious, you take Dr. Strangelove. I mean... I, I, I literally just got full oh, body chills thinking yeah. about how fucking funny this movie is. I mean, you oh it, it, it tells all these different stories as well. You have... I think my favorite. I mean, you have you have Peter Sellers pulling triple duty in this movie, yes, which is yeah. instead incredibly insane. You know, as, they wanted him to pull all duty. They wanted Peter Sellers to play every character in the movie. I didn't know that. That's nuts. But I think you can't you can't discount George C. Scott. Oh my as, god! Uh, yeah, there, Florida, <laughs> we gotta mind the mine shaft gap. You know, he's yelling at the end. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I, I do think that what makes this movie so funny, we're just going to all talk about this fucking movie. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, we love this movie. Is, is how it's the worst scenario. Like, yeah. literally possible. Yeah. The end of humanity. And it's just, it's like a ticking clock of, you know everything's going to shit because everyone's mm -hmm. incompetent, but their incompetence just, like, keeps glancing off of one another and, and no communication is going properly. Good Lord, this movie's so mm -hmm. funny. I mean, you have the classic lines as gentlemen, you can't fight in here. This is the war room. <laughs> war room. Stuff, like, uh, you have like the childish nature of George C. Scott in this. I think he has a line where he's like, "You can't, you can't bring him in here. He's gonna see all the secrets. What if he sees the big board? Well, he's gonna look at the big board. He's gonna take yeah. a picture of it." <laughs> and he does. The, the and call, he does. He does the call between the president, between President Muffley and the premier, the Soviet premier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hello. I'm fine. I mean, like that. I don't even it's remember any. Fun. The the like oh the line no I I'm I'm more sorry than you are. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's so uh, it's so funny. Oh, uh, and I think you have the I think my favorite bit is probably the um, uh, you, the imagery of like uh the, the the AC or the the bomber pilot like riding the nuke backwards onto in, into Russia is great. Mm -hmm. But I think my favorite bit is probably sellers at the end. Uh, when you know they, all the bombs have dropped, you know they're they're coming to terms with the fact that they're all going to die and the world has ended. And Peter Sellers, as Doctor Strange, stands up and he's like doing the Sig Heil and he's like, "Mein Führer, I can walk." <laughs> it's yeah, just off the walls with that co with that comedic performance. And then of course it ends with the you know that that bittersweet sort of message of you know all these the sequence of all the bombs being dropped and like the at the the mushroom clouds and. Uh, the song "We'll Meet Again" is a don't is a great know music when, there. Don't yeah. know where. Yeah, yeah if, like if you haven't seen Doctor Strange Love, that I think, based on all of our reactions, is yeah. probably thus far the one that you need to go watch at ATM at this moment. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's also not a very long movie. It's like no. like eighty ninety minutes, something like that. Yeah, something like very that. Snappy. Uh, Timo, what what is your uh? I know you, I know you said you wasn't uh, in a particular order, but I assume this is maybe one of your faves, your fave of all time. All his faves. Yeah, this oh, is okay. just Fair this enough. is just another <laughs> another fair. comedy movie that I quite like a lot. Um, mm -hmm. And what? yeah, I think you guys might like might have seen and like this one too. It's gonna be Edgar Wright's Hot Fuzz. Oh yes, That's of course. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. like I like Hot Fuzz a lot. Not Shaun of the Dead, but you know. Mm -hmm. I think I just have so much fun with them screwing around in little tiny in little tiny small town England, like all the shenanigans that get that is thrown through, and then it's like a and then it, by the end of it, it's like an action movie, and even yep. its action knows that it's like comedy and like like small scale and therefore funny. I find, yeah, and just like the the actual narrative and like some of the character arcs and the filmmaking of it too is really good. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a brutal movie too. You know, like all all the all the the deaths in this. That, oh you know, yeah, that uh, that, uh <laughs> that Simon Pegg has to solve are brutal, brutal deaths. And uh, yeah, yeah, Edgar Wright has that certain that certain wit to him that that just comes across very well in all of the Cornetto trilogy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have you seen the World's End here? I've not. That's one of the. That's okay, so you I can't fucking talk about the I, I, Cornetto trilogy. I assume, it, I assume it's, it's a great about fucking the movie. Well. Love yeah, that okay. movie, Timo. Okay. You need to go watch the World's End. You okay. know it's about going pub, from bar to bar. It's a pub mm -hmm. crawl movie, isn't it? Yeah. I think I do. Yeah. I in preparation to go to England. 
you know, it's cultural in research. Season, Not cultural cultural research, fun, sure. <laughs> all right, Tucker, what is your number one comedy all time? My number one comedy of all time is not a particular huge surprise if you know me as a person, but Monty yep. Python and the Holy Grail, it might be the single most formative film for me because it's certainly the film I've seen the most time times. It, it's almost 30 times in my life, which is mm. ridiculous for me because I, I particularly I don't really like rewatching movies that much, but I think this film is just instantly connectable to me because it was so formative to my sense of humor and how... Monty Python doesn't do comedy like anyone else. The group Monty Python. And mm -hmm. this movie breaks all filmmaking conventions, which I think makes it a very interesting film to dissect from a filmmaking point of view. And then also all the, the comedy and the creativity and the way that even the credits are a, are a comedy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and they play with the idea of scenes and characters and, uh, and what is reality and are these characters all crazy and does it even matter and making fun of of government and religion and all sorts of politics and all sorts of all sorts of structures and stuff like that i i think this movie is is it's one of my it's my second favorite movie of all time behind avengers endgame because that mm -hmm. was emotionally impactful to me but uh my by the holy grail i think for me is the most quotable movie of all time and i think it also is one of the films that's just filled with the most iconic sequences of all time because it is it's essentially an anthology movie. There, there mm -hmm. is not a hugely structured plot going through the whole thing. It's about King Arthur and his men, and they're going on their adventures, and that's about it. They're looking for the Holy Grail. That's yeah. all the basic setup, basic premise for all these things to be uh, under a veneer of of similar characters and similar sets and stuff like that. But the way that each sequence stands on its own as a sketch, as a comedic bit, and they play on every possible comedic trope that you can get and, and and i also love how a lot like sasha baron cohen i think maybe the, that money python a little bit of an inspiration the way that the the pythons play so many different roles within mm. the film mm -hmm. graham chapman i think graham chapman's the only one that no 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 he, he plays multiple roles um but each each of the of the pythons eric idol john cleese graham chapman terry gilliam terry jones michael palin all all six of them play so many different roles and are bouncing off of each other so frequently that th I, th I think this movie is a, a, not only a must watch, but one of the most creative and unique comedies of all time. I, I want to just throw in an honorable mention because you reminded me on it. Monty Python and the Meaning of Life. Also a very, very funny comedy Also Life movie. of Brian. Yeah. Another great movie. <laughs> Every Christ. sperm is sacred. Thank you. Uh, Tucker, j just yesterday I heard some sacrilege. People saying that the Life of Brian is way better than holy grail and uh, i i had i couldn't i couldn't let that slide by so uh, i i ended up chopping off both their arms and, and a leg of, uh, on them so but yeah. yeah they ended up being fine they were fine i do think that this is also one of the films i think one of the reasons it has this iconic status i think not only to me but to pop culture but it has reached the cult status that few films get like you got like this and rocky horror picture show on like mm -hmm. people getting together yeah and, and celebrating moments of and characters and uh, iconic little bits with the with the coconuts and uh, and the the killer bunny and yeah. all, all this stuff like this movie has a level level of comedy iconography that very few films get because you know we're talking about Doctor Strange Love we're talking about Ferris Bueller great movies mm -hmm. but they don't have these moments that are like culturally recognizable and on a cult status so god damn I love this fucking movie. Tucker, I, I'm so glad you that you set this up because um, we're about to roll around to my personal Monty Python and the Holy Grail, which is 1980s Airplane. Airplane uh, yeah, is yeah. my favorite comedy of all time. If we if we're Actually, judging, quite, quite similar both to Monty Python. Yeah, exactly. Like yeah, they yeah. have the same similar cultural status. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Because if we're talking about uh, the sheer, if we're talking about jokes per minute, yeah. laughs per minute, I think Airplane is probably gotta be the greatest of all time if you're going by that metric just because there is the there there isn't basically a full minute of screen time that goes by without some sort of visual gag uh witty uh line a uh, comedic line wacky character saying something wacky it is just wall-to-wall -wall comedic uh gold in this film i mean you have so many iconic moments and lines from this with the don't call me Shirley and the Kareem Abdul-Jabbar playing himself, but not <laughs> wanting to be recognized as himself. Uh, it's, uh, you know, um, 
what's a hospital? It's a building with a big pe- with a bunch of big with a bunch of doctors in it, but that's not important right now. Um, my favorite gag, uh, because there's so many that you can pull from. You know, this is a, this is a relatively short film, but like I said, it's packed with comedic bits. Is probably the um, <laughs> the flat the the the, the planes coming in for the landing. And it's the people in the tower, like, oh, we we, we just have to hope and pray they're 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 flying on instruments now. And it cuts back to the cockpit, and they're all just like playing trumpets and saxophones <laughs> <laughs> because they'll do stuff like that. They'll just do nonsensical visual gags like that, and it's fantastic. Yeah. Um, you have even the people in the tower who are like, you know, the beat here cast are fantastic. The the running gag of I picked a, I picked the wrong day to stop drinking. Uh, I picked the wrong day to stop smoking. I picked the wrong day to stop sniffing glue. <laughs> <laughs> and he falls over. God. God. Uh, have you guys, you, you've both seen Airplane? I don't think I yeah. have. I, 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 don't, I don't think I have. I have uh, to go see it. God. Yeah, I, the, I, I feel like I'm just going to be like rattling off of bits that are really good. But the, well, Timmy, have you ever been to a Turkish prison? <laughs> <laughs> It is, this is, you know, this comes from um, the Zucker brothers. And I think the, the direction here is really, is really great too, just because you have to balance all these visual gags, mm-hmm. like, uh, and, and create this like through line where you're not losing your audience and all the, all these things, because you'll have all these characters again, playing comedic straight men. None of them acknowledge what they're doing is comedic, but you have one of the main characters walking through the airport at the very beginning and just or t- I think it's towards the middle, actually, and just beating the shit out of people as he's walking along, who are like trying to hand him pamphlets and flowers, and like, hey, sign the sign this petition or whatever, mm-hmm. and that it, it, he just goes on and continues doing the plot. It's it, it's crazy that you know the, that this film is so condensed in the way it is, and that's why I think I love it because I don't think there's really a whiff in here either, and that's really interesting as well. That this that because it's operating on this like same level of just like fun wordplay visual gags things like that that there's not really one that falls flat yeah the one the last thing i want to say as we wrap up this conversation because i was mm-hmm. all of our last movies i believe right mm-hmm. yes uh, is that comedy for me is something that pervades every aspect of my film pleasure mm-hmm. uh so i was talking about my favorite specifically only comedy yes. movies there are comedic elements in most of my favorite movies of all time mm-hmm. i've referenced swiss iron man before i think that's a hilarious movie mm-hmm. but i also think it works really well because of its emotional impact which mm-hmm. you know i'm not talking about the the fucking emotion in dr strange love or or uh, monty <laughs> python or anything like that but mm-hmm. back to the future hilarious yeah. movie yeah grand yeah. budapest hilarious movie even parasite darkly funny yes like, mm-hmm. birdman which we just talked about incredibly funny movie mm-hmm. all these movies have a great sense of humor but i wanted to pare it down to j- literally yeah. just comedy yeah. if you take if you take the comedy out of any of these films i feel like they fall apart i, I think that was my criteria mm-hmm. it's like you could well they did make dr strange of without the comedy it was called failsafe and it came out the same year and it's just not as good it's still a good movie but it plays up you know the drama and things like that but yeah it, 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 comedy is intrinsic to every one of these films and it is a pu- and they are pure comedies i, I want that same criteria too so. they also made a they also made ferris bueller without the comedy it's called risky business and oh like interesting <laughs> oh interesting oh uh, yeah fuck you risky em. business got okay movie ah. <laughs> well anyway Thank you, boys, for joining me today. Uh, thank you for watching. Uh, let us know your favorite comedies down in the comments or join the Discord link in the description. Let us know what you've been watching this month as well. What do you think of... Did you watch any of these new films we talked about? What do you think of everything, everywhere, all at once? Is it the best movie of all time? Like Letterbox thinks it is. Let us know in the comments. Let us know on Discord. And we'll see you next month. My liver, you know. It never mm-hmm. stops working. It makes a little well, worrying. I would I wouldn't count on that. It makes a little worrying. <laughs> It'll never stop working. It'll never stop working. It makes a little whirring noise when I'm laying in bed. I can hear it like pump like freaking like, booting up. <laughs>